Hi guys, in this video we are going to be learning about sea level change, finishing with an exam style question. Firstly, I'm going to give a brief overview to sea level change. And this is a photoshopped photo here showing New York City. And New York City is on a coastline and shows quite an exaggerated picture of what New York could look like in the future if sea rise changes will take place. And we have two different types of sea level change that we're going to learn about, being eustatic sea level change and isostatic sea level change. And it's important to be able to distinguish between the two of them. So eustatic change is a global change in sea level resulting from an actual fall or rise in the level of the sea. So we need to remember, and it's really important, that eustatic is in relation to the changing levels of the sea. Whereas on the other hand, isostatic sea level change is related to the land and it's the sea level change in relation to the land. So local changes in sea level resulting from the land rising or falling relative to the sea level. And this is because land can either go through a period of uplift or subsiding. So this obviously changes the level at which the sea is at on the coastline. So isostatic is land and eustatic is sea. And we really need to remember those. So now I'm going to talk a bit about the sequence of sea level rise to reflect the advance and retreat of ice. As you might have learnt from the chapter on glaciers, a lot of the earth is covered in ice and over the last glacial period, an even greater extent of the earth was covered in ice and this has had great impacts on sea level change, both isostatic and eustatic sea level change since the ice has retreated. So now we're going to look how ice advance and retreat can affect sea level change. So in the stage one of this process, we see the climate getting colder. So as the climate gets colder, we get more snow and snow will form ice and then we get an increase in glacier ice. And therefore, more water in the earth is stored in snow and ice rather than in the sea. So we get an accumulation of ice and snow during these colder periods. So if more water that's being rained or precipitated onto the land is forming snow and ice, this means that less water is being returned to the sea. So the sea level is going to fall. And this is because the hydrological cycle, which brings water from the sea and then rains on land, is then going to cause there to be less water returned to the oceans because it's being stuck within the glaciers. And this is what we are going to call eustatic sea level fall because the actual level of the water in the seas is falling, so it's eustatic. Then in stage two of this process, the weight of the ice on the land is going to cause the land surface to sink. And this is where we get isostatic movement. So for example, if we have a piece of land here and we have a glacier sitting on top, as this glacier increases in size, the land will actually start to sink because of the weight of the glacier. Therefore, the land is subsiding and moving downwards. And if the land is going down, this means that sea level is rising in relation to the land. If the land is lower, then the sea level is going to come up higher on the land. But this only affects some coastlines around the world, but this is an example of isostatic sea level change. Then in the third stage of this process, the climate begins to warm again, and this causes the ice masses on the land, such as the glaciers, to begin to melt. So therefore, this meltwater is going to feed back into the sea, and this is going to restore sea levels, and sea levels going to rise and because this is the rise in sea level, this is called eustatic rise because it's related to the sea level and not the land. And this will cause flooding of lower parts of the land as sea level rises and will produce submergent features. And submergent features are something we're going to look at later on in the video. And this is where the land is submerged underwater. Then in stage four and the last stage of this process, as the ice melts, we're going to get isostatic readjustment. So 
as before, I drew the diagram showing you how the ice was pushing the land down because it's the heavy weight. When the ice melts, the land is going to rise back up to its normal position. And then we are going to find that we have what's called isostatic recovery. This is quite a complicated process, but it's easy just to understand it in this format that when the ice melts, the land moves back up again. And this is going to cause the production of emergent features, which we're also going to look at later in the video. And these form features such as raised beaches, which we're going to look at. In relation to sea level change, we get different types of coastlines in relation to whether the coastline has been submerged by water or emergent coastlines where the water level has actually decreased. So firstly, we're going to look at coastlines of submergence and we can see them in these photographs here. This one being called a rhea and this one here being called a fjord. And they might look very similar, but they're both very different in terms of their characteristics. So I'm going to go through the different formations in more detail now. So rias are very similar to fjords and they form when rising sea levels drown river valleys. So this is the very specific part about rias is that they are essentially drowned river valleys. And that's what's going to distinguish a ria from a fjord. So usually when the river valley, which is emerging onto a coastline, the floodplain will vanish beneath the rising waters and it's typically only the higher valley sides that remain visible upon the land. And so this river valley is then going to be filled with seawater and we get what is called a dendritic drainage system. We don't need to know about this, but that's what it's called. And it has a profile very similar to a river valley. So the cross section would look very much like a river valley, just a very kind of shallow part. And this is the seawater that's filled up the river valley. And it would have the same cross section as a river as well, but obviously not reaching as far up the course of the river as a normal river would. And this is a photograph of a rear here in Cornwall. So the river would originally have flown through the middle of here, but now it's been flooded by seawater as sea levels have risen. And we just have these higher pieces of land that have remained unsubmerged by the water. So now we're going to look at fjords. And in comparison, fjords are drowned glacial valleys instead of river valleys. So where there, there were glaciers used to be, we find a lot of them in Norway and New Zealand. And they're very straight and narrow and very steep sided because glacial valleys tend to be a lot deeper than river valleys because glaciers have a greater erosive power so they erode downward more. So instead of the river valley, the profile of a fjord would be a very steep kind of U-shaped valley and the sea level has then risen and has flooded this valley. So it's very steep and narrow in comparison to the rear which has a more kind of gentle steepness. And they are not actually deepest at the mouth of the fjord where it reaches the sea because we have what's called a threshold which formed when the glacier stopped. So the long section of a fjord would actually look like this. We have a little threshold before it then gets deeper like this. So we would have sea here and across here but we just have this little threshold at the mouth and that's quite an important feature to know because you might be asked to draw the cross section or the long profile of a rear or a fjord in an exam. So this is a little threshold here. And a fjord is shown in this photograph here. So you can see it's got much steeper sides because it was a former glacial valley that's been flooded as sea levels have risen. On the other hand, we have coastlines of emergence, and this is where sea levels have decreased. And this is a photograph here of an emergent beach where we have a wave cut platform. We learned about wave cut platforms in a previous video, but it's essentially a process of cliff retreat. We can see the original cliffs over here and this wave platform, which has been um, emerged out of the water as sea levels have decreased. So, one feature of emergent coastlines is raised beaches and as I said these are former wave cut platforms and they were formed when the sea level was higher than it was at present and the sea has retreated and exposed them. And the other features that we get 
our relict cliff arches, stacks and caves. We also learnt about the formation of caves, stacks and stumps in a previous video and these are just these features that would have originally been in the water or at the coastline but as the water has retreated, as sea levels have fallen, these are now features that are present more further in from the coastline and we can see they're called relic features. So now to finish off, we're going to look at some of the impacts of recent and predicted climate change on coastlines. And changes in sea level due to climate change are caused by either the subsidence of the coast, which would be isostatic change. So that's the change in the land in relation to the sea level. And we'd also get eustatic changes, which is the changes in sea level for two reasons in relation to climate change. Climate change will cause ice melt, which will then increase the volume of the water in the sea, and also thermal expansion because as water heats, it expands, so the volume will increase because the water is getting hotter as global temperatures rise. And this is a graph here showing how sea levels are expected to rise in the next century. So as you can see, sea levels are predicted to rise very quickly and um, a very steep incline. And some of the effects of this predicted sea level change is increased coastal flooding, increased coastal erosion. It will greatly affect areas of local subsidence. So these are low levels of land and areas that are low will be more easily flooded, such as the loss of low lying villages on the east coast of the UK. And also we might have salination, and this is where the seawater, which is salty, will come in contact with the freshwater and cause the freshwater to become salty and will essentially ruin it for drinking water. And it's quite expensive to then turn seawater back into freshwater as it has to be desalinised. And some areas in the UK that are at risk are places like London and Hull, as these are very low-lying areas and they're on estuaries, so if the sea level were to rise, a lot of London would end up being flooded. Now we're going to answer an exam style question, and the question is first asking us to draw a labelled diagram to describe the characteristics of one landform associated with a coastline of submergence, such as a fjord or a rhea. So it's giving us an example here. And so for the sake of this question, I'm going to go with the example of a fjord. So this question only actually requires us to draw one diagram. So I'm going to go with the cross section of a fjord. And it's nice to label that it's the cross section. And as we'll remember from the video earlier on, we had a very steep U-shaped profile of a fjord filled with water. So we can call this side X and this side Y in our cross section. And we might also want to label the height of a fjord, and fjords can tend to be over a thousand meters deep. So it doesn't really need to be an artistic diagram, it just needs to prove that you know the shape and size of whichever landform you choose to draw, and it just needs to be clearly labeled. So then we could just label this saying a fjord. Then the next part of the question asks us to explain the formation of this landform. So now we're going to go on to explain it. So the best thing to do first is to define the landform. So I've written fjords are drowned glacial valleys, typically found on the coast of Norway and New Zealand. It's always good to give an example. And I've said fjords are features of submergence due to eustatic sea level rise. So as we remember, this video is on sea level rise. So it's good to show that you understand that they are formed from sea level rise. This is only a four mark question, so we don't need to give that much detail, but then we can go on to talk about how they are formed in more detail. So we say fjords have steep valley sides and are fairly straight and narrow. This is a bit of a description of what they look like. They have a typical U-shaped cross section like glacial valley. Their deepest point is not at their mouth due to the presence of a threshold. So we learned about this. So this paragraph just describes what the fjord looks like. Hi guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you're looking for an amazing A-level geography resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. See you soon and together let's make A-level geography a walk in the park.